Um, I know there's a lot of other panels right now, but thanks for showing up. And this is really um, probably one of the more informal panels you'll probably go to. We just kind of set this up because uh, despite this being, quote, a show for little girls, uh, the fans of the show obviously are of a very different demographic. And sometimes the uh, intended gender kind of gets sidelined or we're the minority and the, the fandom a little bit. So that can kind of be an interesting dynamic, but also a lot of fun and present some really um, different things about it too. So we're just going to be up here to chat about it. I'm Kaya Marienfeld. I'm a programming staff. Minnesota is my handle online. Obviously, you can figure out what state I am from. Um, and this is uh, Katie Wayne. And you may know me as the girl that played Boxy at one point. I'm a YouTube personality and an actor and all of that other kind of stuff, and also female and a member of the Brony fandom. Yeah. My name is Sophie, and uh, I'm kind of the odd person out up here because I'm not really known for anything. Um, I am the BAPSCON head of business. Um, my job is to make sure that we still have a hotel uh, that's willing to have us back next year. Um, but yeah, that's my job. So, so welcome, everybody. Oh, yeah. Yay! Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <you're too> <laughs> What was that? Applause. I'm just going to hold this up. No, don't. Please don't leave yet. This says see you next year, but please don't go away. Um, so uh, we're going to do a lot of just kind of talking back and forth. If anybody in the audience at any point has anything to add, please just raise your hand. Um, it's We want or questions, anything at all. If something we talk about brings something up for you, if you want to share a story, if you want to share an experience, we're, we're totally game for this. There will be no question screening, so don't like, you know, curse us out or anything. That'd be awesome. But are we allowed to swear? Um, this is an after dark panel, uh, so yeah. if, <laughs> if you would like to swear within reason, I need to keep myself in check too. Um, I, I believe that would be acceptable and Obsidian can tell us no if that's not acceptable. Yeah, what's within reason? What does that mean? Um, PG-13, oh. yeah. That means we can only use the F word once. Oh, oh is that what that means? Ah. You wasted it. Well, buck yeah, then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So uh, I'm just going to start by asking Katie and Sophie questions um, about kind of uh, the first one will be, what was it like for you first getting into the Brony community as a woman? What was your first experience where you're like, oh, this is a little different for me because of, of the ladiness? Yeah. OK, so uh, it's, it's really hard for me to say because for such a long period of time, I was a member of the fandom, but I was not actively participating because I had a grand master plan of, of uh, making a, a boxy video about it, basically, wherein I, you know, because, because on my own personal channel, my, my personal channel isn't as big as my boxy channel, and so I wanted to make it this big grand entrance because when I first, I you know, went through the same rabbit hole that everyone did. First, I hated it. Then I hated that I loved it. Then I loved it. Ram, ram, ram. Right. So, um, but it was the more that I watched the show, the more obviously invested I became in it, and the more I loved it, and the more I realized that it was a genuinely great show, and I thought that more people deserved to be a part of this and not just judge it by the pastel-colored ponies running around. Right. And. Um, so for, for almost a year that I was watching the show, I was not a part of the, not actively part of the fandom. Uh, but I, I guess it's, it's, it's even like I'm like a separate little section of the Brony fandom because I'm already used to people saying rude things about me just because I'm a girl. And so all of the rude things that were said about, you know, normal Pega sisters, if you will, that, you know, that they're just attention whoring and all of that stuff. I was already used to that and I was kind of expecting it. So I, I, I guess the, that's a really long way to say I don't have a special experience. <laughs> 
Sorry, I wasted your time. Okay. <laughs> Um, much like Katie, I don't particularly have a special experience. Um, I, yeah, oh yeah, we're, we're all special up here. We're special because we're not special. Um, but I, I was brought into the fandom from actually a guy's perspective. My, uh, my boyfriend was the one who said, you have to watch the show. It's so amazing. And I went, no, it's My Little Pony. I'm not going to watch it. Um, so it's, for me, it was, I guess it was a little different. I didn't come in with a lot of negative uh, connotations. I didn't have the the internet drama surrounding the show. Um, but I did realize the show was special and unique because of what it promoted and what it had inspired in others. And to me, that was a, a kind of a unique experience. So. I'll share just briefly my background. I was one of those people who was not involved in a fandom at all for my first two years of watching it. I discovered My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, uh, during finals week of my first year of law school. And it proceeded to get me through contracts and torts, which was awesome. If you know what those are, they're horrible, horrible subjects. Um, so I, I, had, I was borrowing my parents' Netflix account on the internet, if anybody else does that, who's poor. Um, and I was like, oh, it's a show. I really liked ponies when I was a kid. All right, let's check it out. And then I proceeded to sit in my living room, ignore studying for finals, and watch seasons one and two of My Little Pony on Netflix streaming. And my boyfriend, who lives with me, was like, what are you watching? Why are you watching this? This is really weird. Um, and then he saw Big Mac, and he's like, that's a cool pony. I like that. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, he puts up with my obsession. But I, I, what really drew me to the show initially was that um, I just really appreciated seeing um, actually well-developed, well-formed, well-written. The animation is beautiful. I know that's what a lot of people are drawn into the show by. Um, but I just really liked the characters. It was fun to see characters that, you know, you have six female characters that aren't all some random weird stereotype of women, which I thought was really awesome because I could see little bits of what I liked about myself and little bits of what I didn't like about myself in all of the characters. Um, and Spike too. I really like Spike. Poor Spike doesn't get love. But uh, uh, it's, I really, really like that about the show. Um, and it drew me and I was like, you know what? This is great. I wish I had this kind of thing when I was a kid because I think it would have been nice to see myself in the stuff that I was watching a lot more because, you know, little girls, you're not princesses and you're not going to be a princess and that's oftentimes really all you see. And there's definitely princesses on My Little Pony. Don't get me wrong, we all know that. But even the princesses aren't just, I'm royal and this is why I'm awesome. It's They have complexities to them. And so that was what really made me stick with the show and neglect my studies as a future attorney. But I made it and we're working, so. Um, all right, does anybody have any questions or comments on that? Yeah. First episode that we liked or first that we watched? First that we watched. What was the first episode you watched? I watched the pilot, man. I, I started right at the beginning and the, uh, to be honest, I hated the first episode. I hated it. I was like, this is stupid. But then I had a cliffhanger, and I was like, that, that is ridiculous. That, why is cliffhanger? Fine, I have to watch the next episode. And then I liked that one a little bit better. But I was like, man, I don't know. But then by the third episode, I was like, no, I want to watch the next one. And so that's the first one that I watched. Strangely enough, I watched the pilot first, too. <laughs> Prior to the pilot, I watched a little documentary that was done by a high school student on why it, the series was so popular. He started off not a fan. By the end of it, he was a fan. <clears throat> and so I thought about it and said, maybe there's something to this. And that was why I watched the first episode. And much like Katie, I watched the first one. I was like, eh. Second one, the second one was like, oh, maybe. The third one was like, where's my next fix? 
Um, mine was also the pilot. This is really boring. But what, what got me into it, I, at first I was like, oh, this is interesting. It's something to watch. I, I, I have to multitask. I'm incapable of cooking anything without watching something anymore, which is a really bad habit to be in. Uh, but I was like, oh, I'll put this on. I'll watch it. And then I was like, I recognize that voice of Twilight Sparkle. And then while I was cooking and watching the show, I went on IMDb and it was like Tara Strong, who was Batgirl, and I was like, I gotta keep watching this show. This is awesome. So Batgirl drew me in initially, and Tara Strong, and then I'm glad I watched the rest because, like Katie said, the cliffhanger. I was like, oh, I need to see what happens now, and it was great. So. You go along with that, then, if you were introducing the show to someone who's never watched it, one episode, you show them. Oh God. No, uh, go. Do you know? No, I don't. I have to think. I have to think about that one. That's a tough one. I'm, I'm like best pony, super biased. I'm like something with Applejack. Should be Applejack. Oh, is Applejack best pony? I like Applejack the best myself, but I think um, something to actually, yeah. I uh, actually had my mom watch a couple episodes of the show when I was home for Christmas break that year after binging on it. <laughs> um, and I showed her the, um, I showed her the, um, I'm totally blanking, uh, the first Cutie Mark Crusaders episode. Um, I thought she's a school counselor and she is all about kids and really hates bullying and I thought she'd really like that episode and she, she dug it. So I think that was a good one to kind of get the whole sphere and to get and there's some of the, I, I love the Cutie Mark Crusaders. I think they're great characters. So that was really fun to watch. And she liked it. So how about it? Well, I think that, for me at least, it would depend on the person and what I knew about them. Like, for example, uh, my mother is a seamstress. And so the first episode that I showed her was Suited for Success. Um, but as a whole, I think that a really great episode to show uh, people, if you don't really know who they are, um, would be the uh, Cutie Mark Chronicles because it really, at least in my experience, I've done that before where I just happened to be watching that episode and someone watched it with me and he was um, very fascinated with the idea of a Cutie Mark and it's it's one of those things that makes you think a little bit where you, the first thing that everyone thinks is, what would my cutie mark be? And, and that's exactly what happened was he started thinking about what his cutie mark would be. And I was like, dude, that is like not even as deep as this show goes. Like this, this show is so impressive with its complexities and the way that it makes you think. And he was like, oh man. And then I saw him like two days later and he was like, I think that my cutie mark would be a paintbrush. I'm like, I'm so glad that you're still thinking about this dude. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that, you're, that you've got so much time on your hands. <laughs> Uh, much like Kitty Wayne, I think the uh, I think the a good first episode would be the Cutie Mark Chronicles, and not actually for the same reasons. Um, it introduces all the characters, but it introduces all the characters by explaining who they are, um, and even really the first couple episodes don't really do that. Uh, and I, I think that's actually a much better way to lead into the series because you go, oh well, here are their histories. Now what have they done? You know what are what have their adventures been to this point, um, and I think that's a, in some ways a better way to go because then you know the characters, and those are what really draw most people in. Do you have any questions from anybody? Comments, concerns? Yes. Yeah, um, so kind of what's the experience coming into the internet community for this versus other shows, other fandoms? I'm, I'm, a, I will, I'm a super nerd, like super comic books, freaking out, like 
the Mary Sue is my homepage, and I read it at work, and people give me really weird looks. They're like, why do you have ponies on your screen? Like, why is Captain America like on the header of what you're doing right now? That's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but I think, I think for me, I don't know, I've had, I think it's very similar. Obviously, there's a lot of crossover fandom, everything. I just today bought a picture that's Applejack and Rainbow Dash is Captain Hammer and Dr. Horrible, which is awesome. Um, but, you know, stuff like that. I think there's a lot of crossover, and I think it's very much the, you know, comic books, superheroes, gaming, everything, and My Little Pony. Everything's kind of wrapped into one. Um, and so I always kind of feel it that way. But I think the creations out of this community, like, it's insane how many... I, and maybe it's because I'm not as in, I haven't been as involved in things. You knew I was a kid more when I was really getting into comics and reading it, and I didn't have the internet as a resource. But for me, just the fact that every single hour there's something you know, new music, new video, new artwork, something coming out, um, I think that's really cool. And I think there are increasingly becoming a lot more women voices in the creative side of the fandom, which I think is really cool because. You know, again, that's something I'm really big on. You know, we're 50% of the population, and if you only get 90% of the stories and creative things told by by guys, I think you're really missing out. Especially because the show was started by Lauren Faust, and it's it's really run. You know, the directors you have, uh, you know, Big Jim Miller, and everybody now you have guys on directors, but you really have the writing staff that's really Megan McCarthy, and she's running everything now. So. I think it's you, if you have a fandom that's run in a different way, you definitely get new experiences, which is really cool. Like, you have, you know, male versions of all the characters, and Spike gets love, and all the dudes get love, which is great, because on the show they don't, for sure. But uh, I think the fact that the fandom is really seeming to shift a little bit and opening up on the creative side more to women is really cool. And I think I've noticed that more um, than I would with you know, people drawing Avengers artwork and making, doing like Avengers cosplay and stuff like that at cons, so. My fandoms are very limited, and so I don't have a whole lot to compare it to, but My Little Pony is very, it's very unique in, in the sense that, I mean, being stating the obvious here, but that it's a show directed for young girls, and then it became a show that the de main demographic was adult men, and then when adult women wanted to also be a part of it and said that they liked it, a lot of the of the male fandom went, ah, oh, why are you this weird that you like this show? Like this is a man show, and it was like, I know, dude, it's way not, <laughs> but 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 it can be, and that's okay. But that is something that I've definitely noticed a lot. Like, it, you know, any girl can walk around and be like, oh, I like Star Wars and I like the Avengers and all of that. And, and boys are like, yeah, that's hot. And, 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 <laughs> and, and that's fine and dandy. But more often than not, um, like, like I said, it is starting to open up a little bit, which is great. Um, but for the most part, I see men that are like, oh, well, you know, you don't really like the show, you're just saying that you like the show, and that's not cool because it's a boy show. And I'm like, and they're, they're pastel colored ponies. <laughs> um, I'm not much on the internet anymore, actually. Um, Good for you. <laughs> yeah, remarkably enough, I have a life. I don't know when I got one, but it just kind of showed up on my doorstep one day. Um, but I did encounter, uh, to illustrate kind of the shift in uh, the internet shift, I'm going to use an instance that I, I encountered on the bus on my way home from work. I had someone who was sitting a little ways away, leaning over and looking. And, you know, I'm dressed, you know, I'm dressed I have a pony shirt on, and I'm, I'm coming back from work, and I'm really tired. And he kind of walks over and looks at me and says, are you a big sister? About like that. Like, well, yeah, some people call would call me a Bega sister. Um, yeah. Oh, my sister's one. Can I take a picture? Uh, so, yeah, apparently I'm a spectacle, and I still haven't figured out why. Um, but there, we're apparently becoming more and more common, and in, both in the world and on the Internet. And I think that's actually a really good thing, because there's there's... The world has so many different perspectives, and for a fan base to limit themselves to say one perspective actually limits 
um, both the creativity of the show or of the, the fan base as well as um, the, the fan base itself. Um, the, I can think of multiple fandoms that I've been a part of over my life and a number of them I, I go to a convention and it's the same people that were there 35 years ago and there's no new blood. And some of that's because of the attitude the fan, fandoms generate and some of it is uh, you know, some of it is that, that it's so closed that it's really hard to have that inclusivity. And that's one of the things that, that I like about this fan base is that it's it's pretty much, not necessarily all open arms, but it's certainly, it, it's certainly got a much broader, more inclusive fan base. And, it, and it's broadening, and that's even better. Yeah, to add on what Sophie was uh, saying, I've seen that too, and it's been really crazy. I've There have been people who are total newbies to the fandom, and I've just been reading comments on some story on Equestria Daily, and someone's like, hey, I'm new here, how's it going? This is a cool show, I just found this site. And 15 people respond to them and say, hey, here's my Skype name, here's my Twitter handle, you guys should, you should follow me, let's talk. Welcome, you know, welcome to the herd. Like, that's awesome, and you'd see that on other, you know, some other message board for you know comics or some other like you know like Star Trek they're like oh well how long have you been watching it for like what's your favorite you know you kind of you get you get the inquisition coming into a lot of other fan bases and here it's like sweet we have another person awesome which I don't know if anybody else's experiences have been that way but you don't really have to like prove yourself to be a fan of My Little Pony. You can have watched one episode or no episodes and everybody's really welcoming and I think that's really cool. And like Sophie was saying, it increases the fan base and it, it, it gives us something to grow off of instead of shutting people out in the first place, which is really important. Um, question, next question. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. So I had to actually go and ask some women. Um, they were, I, it was very awkward for some of them. So uh, how would you react to someone asking you something that kind of person? Uh, is there a proper way to approach that type of sort of situation? So that way, you know, someone like myself could actually do it properly instead of uh, thinking of something that I just can't. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. That's a strange question, but it's a good question. No, and I'm glad you're, no, the fact that you feel the need to ask that question, I think says a lot, because that means you're aware of the nature of it, which I think is really important. Yeah, totally, and I, I don't know how to think like a guy either. Um, my very feminine friends think I know how to think like a guy, and they ask me, they're like, so um, would my boyfriend like this shirt? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, but no, you're right. Like if somebody came up to me in the hall here and was like, so what's it like to be pregnant? I'd be like, get away from me now. And maybe knee them somewhere. But like, I, I don't know, at least for me, maybe you guys can speak to that. But just like you said, like you just prefaced it. Um, you know, this is what I'm doing. Here's why I'm asking you this question. Do you have a minute? You know, recognizing like, you know, just because you're, and I think something that's really important is saying, would you be able to answer this too? Because I think assuming that all women could answer that question as well would, would kind of be odd. What do you think? Well, I know for one, I'll never be able to answer that question. So, uh, um, speaking to like not being able to think in that manner or, or understand what it's like, um, I do have some advice on that front. I am a second generation role player. Um, and I am nearly 40, despite how I look. Um, so the hardest thing to do is to think like somebody you're not. Okay, good, good, good. Um, the only thing I can suggest is research, 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 and then immersing yourself in the character. And the easiest way to do this, weirdly enough, is on the internet. Um, and then ask, your que ask yourself questions like, 
what would it be like to do this? Or what would it be like to experience this? What's the closest analogy I can come to uh, as a guy that is like this? And um, for childbirth, it's I'm told it's like kidney stones. But I can't be positive because there's this whole hormonal thing that goes on too. And it's, it's radically different. Um, Well, I can't. But um, yeah, no. Um, as far as uh, what's that like? That decision-making process like? I don't know. It's that's a tough one. Um, that's a really good question. You have an answer? All right. Yeah. Um, I think actually, I think it's actually a lot more mental and less physical than people think. Um, I think the same process that a guy goes through. I, and again, I'm not a guy, so I can't speak to this. The same process that the the male in the relationship who's considering having kids goes through mentally thinking, where am I in my life? What do I want to do? You know, what's going on now? Can I support another human being? I can't even do my laundry on a regular basis because that's my thought right now on kids. Um, but. I think it's really, it really is, you know, we always have this, you know, like it's a biological urge for women to have children, like we must procreate, but yeah, and men have it too, totally. Um, but I really think it's that whole, I think it's much more logical, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, like you said, I really don't know, I don't have kids, I haven't really thought about it too much, but it's really that, you know, what it, what is that sort of switch that, that clicks? And I think it's more situation. It's like, you know, I'm at a good place right now in my life, or I'm with somebody that I can see, like, not hating enough to raise a small little screaming thing with, you know? So. Y'all are thorough. Um, but I, as far as trying to figure out that information, um, I think that the way that you prefaced it, as, as she said earlier, is, is a good way to, to make it a little bit less invasive um, as far as, you know, just being like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm writing and I don't understand this. And so maybe, you know, would you be willing to talk with me about that? But, but you know, expect girls to be like, you motherfucker, get away. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a guy. I can't know this. Yeah. Can't help All right. Cool. You seem very on top of it. The one in the back's been waiting. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? People like saying things online they don't say in person? <laughs> that is crazy. We got a quick one. <laughs> yeah, uh, who, who were you? That one. Yes, our AV lad. So wait, 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 wait. You're saying that just because I find these cartoon horses attractive, that's a wrong reason. We're going to eliminate a lot of people. I know. God. I, I, I don't think that I've ever run into a situation where someone was like, you like this fandom for the wrong reasons, or you like this show or anything, because, I don't know, for the most part, the reason why I like something is because I think it's good. Um, and, you know, I mean, characters, people are attractive, like Tenant. Tenant is lovely. And, but but I but I still like the show outside of that, and um, 
I, but even if a girl only did watch a, sh a show just because Tenet was attractive and then stopped watching, I don't think that that necessarily means that she likes something for the wrong reason. I think it just means that she's a Tenet fangirl as opposed to a Who fangirl. No, oh, no. <laughs> Um, I haven't quite encountered that. I don't know. I like I said earlier. I like I like MLP because you don't get the Inquisition when you declare yourself a fan of the show. Like you do. Like and I was trying not to bring this up. Is any the the fake geek girl phenomenon, oh, yeah. which oh. I'm sure drives the other two panelists away. But um, if you declare you like something, often in another fandom, you get accused of liking it for the wrong reasons, even if you don't like it for the wrong reasons by nature of being a woman. For instance, I love Lord of the Rings, like hardcore love it. My older brother and I talk about it all the time. It drives my five-year-old nephew insane. We'll be like, oh yeah, did you see the way that Thorin's beard was in the last movie? And like super nerdy. But um, I, I will tell other people, they go, oh, it's just because you thought so-and-so was hot in the movie. And I'm like, okay, whatever you need to tell yourself. You know, it's that whole having to rationalize um, a reason. Like Katie was saying, I don't think there's a wrong reason to be a fan of everything. It's if, Yeah, yeah, if you think it's because Orlando Bloom is hot and you like Legolas, then be a Lord of the Rings fan. If you have read all the books every year since you were 12, then you can be a Lord of the Rings fan too. But um, I, I think it's that assumption oftentimes because of, um, and, and not always gender too, if you're, uh, non-typical, I mean, it's like MLP, you get, you get people outside the fan community who think you're, you know, a 20, 30-something guy who likes the show, it's a weird thing, and it's creepy, it's because, you know, you get, everybody knows the, the really bad stereotypes of bronies, and it's that whole, you get that, you know, oh, you must only like it for this reason, I think it's really harmful to everybody, and I like that this fandom doesn't do that, it's awesome, so... I have actually encountered this. Um, I am a member of a, a very narrow margin. I am a woman who does lightsaber choreography. Um, and as one of the, uh, I think, 10 or so people in my organization, um, I often run into a situation where I meet another Star Wars fan and I go, I do lightsaber choreography. And they look at me like, why? Did your boyfriend do it? No, my boyfriend lives 3,000 miles away. Thank you. No, I do it because I enjoy putting on a show, and I like Star Wars. Um, so yeah, I have encountered that, and and it's a uh, it's a difficult thing to overcome because so many people they want to they want to put you in this nice narrow category that matches up with what they think you should be, rather than what you really are. And uh, again, like you were saying, uh, the, sh the My Little Pony show, the, the fandom, the fan base, is much more open in that regard. Hey, I watched one episode and I really like this one character that had no speaking lines. Okay, great. Join the herd. <laughs> we're all here. Pity you didn't like a character that talks because then we could direct you to some really cool stuff. But, you know, awesome, welcome. Yeah. And I know that it comes down to just semantics because I have, you know, I talk to real growing the person and they're like, we don't care, whatever. Yeah. Show up. But I just wonder for other women, how is it when you get involved in the community, even to an extreme level, like being part of con, how do you take that sort of like separate mental health? Mm. Do you want to speak to that? I, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Um, you went, mm, so. I, a well, uh, it's, it's, it's really like I, like I completely understand exactly what you're talking about and that's why I went, mm. um, but to that, it, you know, I would say, uh, I already used my F word. Um, I, I would say screw that man. You know, like that's, it's, it's dumb. It's like, that's, you want to call me a Pegasus or all you want, that's fine. But, you know, I'm, I, if I'm going to label myself, I would label myself as a brony um, because I don't, 
I personally, me, don't feel the need to label myself as something different because of my gender. And I'm a fan of this show, and so I'm gonna call myself a brony. And if you feel uncomfortable that I'm invading your fandom, sorry. Sorry about it, I'm gonna get my nails done. Oh my god, I don't remember what the question is now. Um, <laughs> okay, got it. Um, yeah, I think, uh, no, you're right, getting involved in the fandom, and I think, I don't know, it, nails on a chalkboard for me right now, I, I think in, within the fandom it's really respectful, but it's really, it's those stories you see with, you know, on CNN or wherever, and it's, Bronies, the adult male fans of My Little Pony in every single story. And then inevitably the comments is always like, there's some ladies too. And we're just like, hi, how's it going? Um, I, uh, it, it's, I think it's outside the community, which I think, like we were saying, I think the community itself is really welcoming of anybody and everyone. But it's that, you know, it's that. 16 year old girl who's reading that story who's like oh my little pony what's up oh could I be a brony oh they're adult male fans so maybe not just because they see it on you know ABC news or something like that um, but I I originally was like oh I like Pegasus sister but then the more I thought about it it's like you know what my cousin who's a doctor isn't a lady doctor she's just a doctor so I kind of like the all-inclusive nature of it because I think it makes um, you know, this is this is Bay Area Brony Con. It isn't um, Bay Area Brony Spectacular, excuse me. Um, it isn't Bay Area Brony and Pegasister Spectacular. So I think I feel more part of it when I identify myself as a Brony, too. Well, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about labels. Labels are there to categorize and divide. And uh, by saying, oh, Bronies and Pegasisters, you're basically saying, well, you know, there's two different groups. They, they, they like it for different reasons. And that's not necessarily true. Um, we're all here on Earth and we are all humans. Um, likewise, all of us here in this room, we like My Little Pony. We're bronies. Yeah, I think it lends itself to the, the binary gender system too, which I think is also really harmful, particularly because there's such a huge um, GLBTQ trans contingency in the fandom and if you know if you don't gender identify one way or another all the time you would be like well, well I'm feeling like a Pegasister today but you know maybe tomorrow I want to be a brony and like I said that divide it's it's super I think harmful Should we have a, bra a new name brainstorming set? <laughs> the unit, I don't know what, what, what? EUP. What is EUP? Oh, did you not see the next the new episodes? No, I haven't seen the new one yet. Again, that problem with both names uh, actually comes back to an, an issue I have with our society as a whole. Um, there are labels everywhere that are trying to tell you who you are, what to be, how to be, why to be, um, and I, I have problems with them. I do. Um, I just don't know how to change them. Um, you know, I'm a fan of MLP. You won't hear me use the term brony. Uh, in reference to myself, because I am so much more than just a brony. I'm a fan of MLP. I'm a fan of um, <laughs> action movies with lots of explosions. Um, I, I'm more than just one thing. And to say that I am this is to kind of tell people that, oh, I'm only that one thing. And that's not true. Not at all.
Questions? Other questions? Top talking points. Talking points? Comments? Yeah. I think label yourself is the operative word there too. Is you saying like, like I said, like I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd, and I would probably call myself a brony, and I also am a Minnesotan, and I am, you know, it's those things you're calling yourself. It's not. It's not somebody coming up to you and saying, "You're this. You're a brony, right? Or you're a Pegasus. Or like I, you know, Pegasus is fine, and some folks identify with it. But if somebody came up and was like, oh, hey, Pegasister, that would annoy me instead of another person saying, hey, I'm a Pegasister, how's it going? You know, something like that. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, they, they, label yourself, exactly, be yourself. Uh, because I, like everyone here, I am not just a brony, as we've talked about multiple times. But, um, How's everyone doing? How's everyone, how's everyone doing, guys? I really, yeah, yeah. Um, how were you guys in the first so, your question is, how did we get into it? Um, my original, well, my first exposure to it was on 4chan and on the internet as a whole. And I was like, oh no, brownies, that, that sounds bogus. And I, like that, that's never going to last. And, um, and I, <laughs> hindsight's 2020 guys. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I just kind of, I didn't, it didn't necessarily bother me. It was just one of those things that I was like, oh, that's a fad. That's not, you know, whatever. And one day, one of my uh, male friends who I respect very much uh, came up to me and he was, and I was just on his couch looking at stuff on the internet. And, uh, and he was like, hey, Katie, do you watch My Little Pony? And I was like, no, because I knew what was coming. And he was like, well, you should. And I was like, Dan, are you going to you gonna do this to me? Like, really? Is, you're going to make me watch the stupid show. You're going to make me do this. And he was like, yeah, you should not be so close-minded. And I was like, how dare you call me close-minded? I am the most open-minded person I know. And, and so I, and then I gave it a shot. And, and then I eventually fall in love. And true, and true story. For the first few episodes, I despised Pink Pony. I was like, this girl, I hate this. I, why? I hate this little, little so random kind of girl. But she's now Best Pony. She's Best Pony. That's all right. Uh, my first exposure um, was the boyfriend coming to me and saying, you have to watch this show. It's amazing. I think you'll really like it. OK, what's it called? My Little Pony. Uh, that 80s show? No. No, 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 no way. Um, let's watch something else. I think you'll really like it. No, 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 no. Not gonna watch it, absolutely refuse. This went on for about three weeks, um, which was a really long time for me to resist watching anything. And he says, okay, look watch this little documentary, and if you watch the first five episodes and you still don't like it, never again. I'll not talk to you ever again about this show, let it drop the whole nine yards. <clears throat> and yet he's upstairs sleeping in the room while I'm down here running panels at a pony con here two years later. <laughs> so that should tell you how it turned out. Yeah, we uh, talked about this early, but I, I found it on Netflix when I was just looking for something to watch to get away from studying for finals in law school. Um, and after I liked it, I went on the internet. I was like, oh, this is great. I wonder if there's more things I can do. And I did not know bronies were a thing. And this was in season two. I started watching it. And so the brony movement was well on by then. You were taken by surprise. 
I was taken, and I had no idea. And I was like, I, I, well, no, I remember I, I was... I was looking to find episodes of season three, which had just started, and I was like, watch season three, My Little Pony, and it was like, brony this and brony that, and what is this? And, I, and then I was on Equestria Daily for like three hours afterwards, like, <laughs> what is this? This is awesome, hi, what's this? But um, the, the boyfriend thing, my, my boyfriend, uh, he, he obliges my, my obsession, but um, I just took pictures of all the stuff I got in the vendor hall, and he was like, oh God, where's it gonna go now? <laughs> um, but he really likes Big Macs, so I made, for his Valentine's Day present for me last year was watching Hearts and Hooves Day. I made him watch Hearts and Hooves Day. I was like, it's Big Mac, you'll really like it. Do this for me for Valentine's Day. Um, Did he like it? He liked it. He's not, he's not that kind of person who's like, this is amazing, but he liked it. So, so does this mean you're going to get in pictures of Princess Alicorn Big Mac? Is there a Princess Alicorn Big Mac? Oh, Peter New said he was going to do it this year. Yeah, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Awesome. Uh, who, somebody else said. Yeah. I was in a staff meeting and I got this little message from one of our panelists that said, hey, you're like really highly placed in, in, in Harmonious Elements, which is the company that runs this thing. Um, would you like to do a panel? Because I need panelists. Okay, what's it about? And that's how I got involved in the panel. Um, so. Um. I don't know the whole process, but I do know that um, I think that this panel was originally my idea, but then I was like, I am not even close to organized enough to do this, so instead I'm gonna do like some informal Q&A thing of my own. And, um, and then I got approached um, again, and they were like, hey, that panel, you should do that. And I was like, okay, because, you know, women's and the, and the ovaries and boobs, yay. <laughs> yay, stand together, woo. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's how that happened, at least from my end. Yeah, woo. So exciting. This night, man, whew, crazy. <laughs> it's, it's really awkward in here, guys. We need to bring up the energy. Come on. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Yeah! There you go. All right. What's up? No, please do. Um, in Game of Thrones, I don't know if any of you uh, are Game of Thrones fans, but there's a Sorry. character called Cersei. Okay. And Cersei is a woman in a time where men have basically no rights. Mm -hmm. Now, a man might try to expect change to his own feelings, but Cersei doesn't do other things. She's secret, she's sly, she is seductive, she does. She works with other characters to achieve her own ends because she has to, because she's a woman. Okay. And was there a question in there at all? I was just wondering what your thoughts were on female characters as as character as male as the same as males. Does anyone have yeah, any specific sure. thoughts? Um, I think that's an interesting example you're bringing up. Um, yeah, I think it's a weird line to walk because in, in one way you want to be realistic and like Game of Thrones, like you were saying, it's this society that's very different from what we have now. Um, but I think uh, it's really hard society. I, I, would, I would almost argue with you that female characters and male characters aren't that different in their motivation. Um, but at the same time, what you were saying about that sort of societal, but you're right, like women, you know, it's that whole, you're behind the scenes pulling the strings as a woman instead of being the person who's out front saying, I'm in charge of everything. It's Cersei, you know, whispering in someone's ear and then controlling. Like, she has her stuff together and she 
you know, everybody's her minion pretty much. Um, but a lot of people don't know about it and it's not very upfront. And I think that that motivation is definitely there and that's something that historically I think has been that way. Um, but now, like you said, like, you know, I think, you know, Pinkie Pie would go about something in the same way that, you know, Spike would. He, she wouldn't have to be like, hey, Applejack, you need to do this for me. You know, she'd be like, Applejack, what's going on? Let's do this. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, and the same way Spike would ask for something. I don't think, I think on the show, um, it's not necessarily different, but you're right, with the societal sort of constraints, there's definitely differences in how they've been written based on what you know, what, what seems realistic. Like you said, um, it wouldn't, it would be weird on that show if Circe went about it in a different way, so. Um, back to what you were saying about how women are portrayed in, in media and, and film and whatnot. Um, for the most part, yes, this is true, but every once in a while you get a groundbreaking thing that changes the way we look at women in movies or on TV. Cersei is one, uh, so is Daenerys. So is Ripley in Aliens, an alien. Here you have a, a woman who's not only uh, the crewman on board a ship, she's third in command. Uh, in the 70s, that was unheard of. Um, likewise, having her as an action hero in the sequel, in the 80s, that was unheard of. Um, it, it really depends on the settings and the character in many respects because you'll have strong-willed women that will do whatever it takes to accomplish what they're out to do. It, it really matters on their background and their own skill set and how they're wired uh, mentally and emotionally how they go about that. Um, in some ways they're just as complex and just as driven as any male character. They Sure, there are differences. Um, but those differences could be minute. Um, There's a film not long ago with Angelina Jolie called Salt. And Salt is basically a female James Bond, but a, a much more brutal character. One could argue that she was just as driven as any other spy. Um, just because the character's reproductive organs are on the inside, as, they, as uh, Carter would say from SG-1, um, doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, our society wants to make it out like it does, but at the end of the day, there's not really that much of a difference. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Did you say this about Ripley? But Ripley was actually supposed to be a male character, um, and they decided to make it a woman. And I, I don't know, there's a lot of things like that. I think the best test for if you've written a, a good female character is slapping a male name on it, seeing if the story still reads realistically, and if it does, then you've written a good female character. I think that, that makes a lot of sense in those whole, like, I need to write like a woman, I need to think like a woman. Um, you know, there's a lot more similarities, I think, than differences, ultimately. I think we um, have time for probably one more question. If somebody who hasn't asked one yet has anything to say, that would be our first choice, but otherwise. Yes, Obsidian Winter. Golden Gates is in the lobby. That's awesome. We did not know that. We will get out there and see her. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> how, how do you grasp around the idea of just being able to, like, I always get like, a small thing. How do you sometimes just look past that and walk into bigger picture? Like, I keep getting these roadblocks and I'm thinking about small things. About small things? Yeah. Like, writing or about writing a woman? Writing a woman. Writing a woman. Um, I don't know. And actually, shameless plug, tomorrow there is a panel with Heather Neufer, Megan McCarthy, Amy Keating Rogers, and GM Barrow, that is about what it's like to write women for My Little Pony in all forms, comics, books, and on the show. And that would be an awesome question to ask them. If you could go to that panel. But do you have something to say so? I have some, I have some observations on this, having um, being 30 year veteran of role playing and playing characters on the internet since 91. Um, 
when you're writing or putting your mindset into a different character um, of a different gender or, this, or even the same gender, if you get caught up on the details, you can t you, there's this tendency to want to explain away every little thing. Um, and this is true in a lot of writing. Um, sometimes it's better not to obsess on the details. Sometimes it's better to say, okay, so it, you know, a great example is Star Wars. We turn on the hyperdrive. Well, what's it do? How's it work? It doesn't matter. Um, in some cases, if you obsess on the details, you get to a point where as a reader, if you go back and you read it from the perspective of someone reading it, that you have a story, you have a story, you have a story, oh, you have a wall of detail, and then you have a story again. And it slows down the pacing sometimes to do that. Um, if the detail's not important, don't put it in. Um, this is why actually going back to Ripley. Ripley works so well as a character because the character is not written in a huge amount of detail. The character can be male or female. Sure, there are differences in how the character moves, talks, and acts, but they're so minute as to not, not to make that big of a difference. And I, I think sometimes writers, especially writers that are, that are just starting to write, get into the habit of putting in too much detail. Um, and it, 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 it can kind of cause a disconnect between what the character's supposed to be and what they actually are. No, that's all right. I think we're getting uh, invaded here. So we're going to wrap up. It's, yes. I, Get out. <laughs> Every single one of you, get out! You're lucky I already used my F word. I can't. You know what? You sit down. I can't do it. <laughs> jokes, 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 jokes. Yeah, all right. Maybe. Last comments from anybody before we get stuff wrapped up? Question, last question. Last, yes. Um, I'm trying to really simple uh, How would you deal with certain members of the community who are not necessarily in the same gender as you? Ooh, deal with members w that, okay, clarify, within the community that are enraptured with the more negative aspects. Can you give an example? In is not in as appropriate of a manner as possible. I have my clan who likes to post many links to inappropriate pictures. It has basically chased away every female clan member we've ever had. Yeah. So, so the, the How do you deal with it? Okay. Um, I don't like it, but I, it was a bad I am, I am real bad at feeding the trolls. I am really bad at it. I waste a lot of time trying to talk to people who can't be talked to. Um, but I think, I think kind of sometimes you get to that point where it's like, well, do I need, like you said, like people have been leaving, women have been leaving the group, but I think it's that, you know, is it worth my time to stay here? Or, you know, can you grit your teeth and bear it out a little bit and try to just gradually, you know, be that voice there and actually still be a part of the conversation instead of leaving the conversation? Um, I think is, is honestly the best thing you can do. Be like, hey, I'm here, I'm a lady, that's kind of offensive. It'd be awesome if you didn't post that, you know? I'm still here instead of leaving and then they're like, well, sweet, now we can post this and they know lady's gonna say nothing about it, so. So, exact opposite of you, I am excellent at ignoring trolls. I am like an expert. I really am so great at blatantly ignoring things that I don't want to give attention to, which is what you gotta do, right? Because then they get bored and they're like, no, she's not responding the way I wanted her to, and they get very sad. And um, so I like, I deal with most things, I just ignore it, like like blatantly, and I don't know if that's a rare thing, um, but that's how I personally deal with images 
and, and, and bad things that I don't want to see. I just kind of ignore it and go about my merry way and start talking about the depth of the punk -a punk and all that stuff. I'm actually kind of somewhere in between the two of you, so this is a good, this is a good thing. Um, I, I've been in many groups that have made me uncomfortable. Um, I've also been in groups where that intent to make an individual or a group of individuals uncomfortable. And look, folks, we have Golden Gates. So epic. I love it. We got a fish pump makeup also. Oh, yeah. Now this is a real panel. So as I was saying, I've been a, a member of, of two types of groups, but I think it's important to figure out why they're posting these things. If they're posting them because they think they're cool, well, trying to deter them from that fact is, is nigh impossible because people are going to think what they're going to think. On the flip side of it, if they're doing to troll people, well, mm, ignoring them is probably the way to go. Um, but it all depends on also how valuable uh, how much you want to be a part of that group. Um, from my perspective, any group that intentionally goes out of their way to make me uncomfortable, I don't have the time or the interest in spending time with them. I'll go where I'm wanted. I think that's it for us, you guys. Thank you so much for coming. This is wonderful. And thank you, Golden Gates, for coming to our panel. Woo! Everybody get a hand for Golden Gates. And a big thank you to Katie and to Sophie for getting on this and all of you for showing up and go have fun for the rest of the night.